Good evening and welcome to Chapter 8, the CIA, the Cover Story Intelligence Agency and the Real Life Clandestine Operator. We're on page 211 of our book, The Secret Team, written by Colonel Fletcher Prouty, written in 19... in the 90s. And some of you may not understand the, the documentation of the words I'm speaking. It makes perfect sense, the preface, and so does the, rec the rest of the documentation. And it definitely correlates to the conditions that we're dealing with this time and is accentuating the current factors of what the secret team has evolved into and what they're up to. The CIA likes to publicize itself as it wishes to be seen. It tries consistently to ma maintain its cover story. These facts would not be publicly admitted by the agency, but they are our facts. It is only fitting to note that when Alan Dulles died, he was writing a book about communism and subversion. This was his very first love, as it was J. Edgar Hoover's. This was his occupation. Intelligence was his av avocation. When he was writing about communism and subversion, he was writing, of course, about the real work of the CIA. He liked to write about the CIA, and he liked to see what others wrote about the CIA. After his re retirement from the agency in the fall of 61, he wrote a very interesting book entitled The Craft, keyword, The Craft of Intelligence. The book is good reading. It contains a lot of folklore about the peripheral world of intelligence. But it always, but it says almost nothing useful about the CIA. In fact, he is intended it that way. It tells a great many things about the CIA that was designed to create the picture of a noble CIA, one that really does not exist. This was typical of Alan Dulles. Other CIA men have written about the CIA, the most able Kirkpatrick Jr., longtime career intelligence stalwart and executive director of the CIA, wrote a book too, which he called The Real CIA. This is unquestionably the best book written by a CIA man about the CIA. It is as forthright and as honest a book as any career man has written or may ever write. Later authors will have missed the great pressures and inner violence of the early struggles from the days of the OSS and its inheritance internecine battles with the Navy and with MacArthur through the days of the post-World War II hiatus and then to the struggles from 1947 to the Korean War. This was truly formative period and this was a time which spawned giants. Lyman Kirkpatrick was written, has written an elegant book but it leaves much to be said. This is not to suggest that considerations of security have intervened, it is rather to su suggest that these career professionals who have devoted their lives to these cause and who have totally lived the party line just cannot bring themselves to see some things as they appear to others. See things, see some things as they appear to others. Some people cannot see things as they appear to others. Central Intelligence Agency. And then admit it even if they should. There is much about a life in the agency that is like a religious order or a secret fraternity. After these men, numberless, others have written about the CIA. A great percentage of this latter group has written about the CIA at the bidding and urging of the agency. An organization such as the CIA, which exists in a true never, never land, needs to have someone write about it so that there will always be a plethora of material available. And so that this vast stew pot of material will be what the agency wants the world to believe about it but it works do doggedly and brilliantly at times to bury anything, not that the party line, not the party line that is written it about it. Thus the agency has a whole stable of writers, its favorite magazines and newspapers, its publishing houses, and its backgrounders ready to go at all times. Alan Dulles had 12 or 13 regular members of the news media who would be invited to join him frequently for lunch in the beautiful old dining room he maintained in East Building across from his office. Many an agent or military officer who had been invited to his offices to meet with him or with his deputy general Cabell to discuss matters of utmost secrecy would be astounded at lunch, at lunch with them to find the room filled with these well-known written writers and commentators and then as lunch proceeded the same subjects that on the other side of the hall had been so carefully shrouded in secrecy would become table gossip with these men of the press. Dulles believed that if he could 
he kept these men well informed, they would then be able to draw the fine line between the CIA party line and its security limits. Even as Dulles re regularly placed himself at the mercy of the Lions, he played a bigger game. If he gave them a bit of insight into the workings of the agency, he also gave them a heavy mixture of that special brew, which he was good at con concocting. He fed them the CIA point of view all the time, just as he fed so many others from presidents on down, and as he fed the readers of his book. His greatest bit of writing in his special field is regrettably hidden away under the heavy secu security wraps, although by now there cannot be a thing in it that would warrant classification. The report written by Alan Dulles, Matthias Correa, and William Jackson in the later part of 1948 was a small masterpiece. It clearly and precisely outlined what Alan Dulles was going to do, and to his credit, he did that and more. During the busy summer of election 1948, Alan Dulles was officially the speechwriter for the Republican candidate, Governor Dewey of New York. Oh, that must be my relative. I'm a Dewey. Anyway, it doesn't matter. All through the campaign, it had been generally accepted that Dewey would defeat President Truman. Alan Dulles, his brother John Foster Dulles, and the others of the Dewey team fully expected to move into Washington on the crest of a wave with the inauguration of their candidate. In this context, then, the Dulles Correa Jackson report takes on a special meaning. Although this select committee had been established by President Truman, they had timed their work for delivery to the president during his the expected lame duck period. They had planned to use it as their own plan of action in the new Dewey administration. In one of the greatest political upsets of all time, Truman beat Dewey. Good. And the Republicans were forced to wait another four years. Thus, it happened that this crucial report on the National Intelligence Community was reluctantly delivered into Truman's more than hostile hands on January 1st due to other circumstances. Alan Dulles did spend 11 years in the service of the CIA and at least 10 years prior to that in endeavors directly related to intelligence. It was not until he left government service in late 1961 that he began his book published in 1963, The Craft of Intelligence. This book, which he was to leave to the world in his public definition of the agency, says very little that is real about the agency and very little that is real about intelligence. It contains all manner of contrived concepts designed over the years to make people believe that, CIA, that the CIA was what he was saying it was and all, that all of the authority he said it had did exist. Any reader who thought the CIA was anything like the description contained in the book will be excused for his thoughts because if ever a subject was painted in camouflage and in words of Gill, that was it. This really is not a light matter. Not only did Alan Dulles portray the CIA in public as something that it most certainly was not, but he had done so for many years within the U.S. government. Let us see how Alan Dulles presents the subject of secret intelligence and clandestine operations. He opens the book with a personal note. He wants to take the unissued... Un an initiated reader into the confidence at once. Those who have seen him operating with such public figures as Joseph Alsop have seen the same approach. The fatherly figure couldn't possibly be weaving a web of connivance around the unsuspecting fly, whether he be a well-known writer or an unknown reader. By the time he gets to the page six, he says CIA is not an underground operation. All one needs to do is to read the law. The National Security Act of 1947 to get a general idea of what is up to, what it is set up to do. It has, of course, a secret side and the law permits the NSC, which in effect means a president to assign the CIA certain duties and functions in the intelligence field in addition to those spe spe specifically enumerated in the law. These functions are not disclosed. Without delay, Mr. Dulles begins to soften up the innocent reader first, the blunt statement, which means nothing. The CIA is not an underground operation. The trick here is that he is saying bluntly what is fact. It is not an operation, but he intends to lard the book 
with as much justification as he can muster to support the contention that the CIA is entitled to operate underground. Then he nearly says that in reading the law, a person will get a general idea of what the agency is supposed to do. Right away, he has the reader thinking that if the law only sets forth the general idea of what the agency is set up to do, then there must be some other law that gives it other powers. Of course, there's so there's no such thing. Next, he says it CIA has, of course, a secret side. True again, like the opening statement. But that is not because of the law, although he hopes the reader thinks that the law provides for the secret side. Then as he then as if to lift the edge of the curtain to let the uninitiated initiated see a bit of the promised land, he adds, the law permits the NSC to assign. Note the use of the words assign rather than the word which is in the law direct. So the CIA certain duties and functions in the intelligence field, in addition to those specially enumerated in the law, here he has set up the idea secret side in the mind of the reader and then proceeded to weakly paraphrase subparagraph five on the list of duties quoted above. Notice also that he says the NSC, which in effect means the president, this is a subtle and most meaningful suggestion than one recalls that this book was written in the Kennedy era from 1961 to 63. Diverse. So now you can see how week to week there is a list of assignments that Gary Vaynerchuk must compose and create. And he's very thoughtful in creating the content to create the content to be positioned in proper proportions to create the necessary actions to follow through so he can continue his career. So it's a basically a bully service with the democratic gover government as Monavand utilizes a paycheck to manipulate the masses so she can be famous and make money off of you. And then abuse the entire thousands of individuals across the world and think she's powerful. However, she has no education, no money really. It is true that President Kennedy did all but abandon the NSC and that in doing so, the NSC became only the president. Nearly in fact, this reveals much more than it says then one recalls that the young president had selected only two of the Eisenhower appointees to remain in his administration. One of them was Alan Dulles. This was, this, thus we see that if Alan Dulles had personally briefed the new president on the way the CIA worked, he might very well have done it just as he was doing in his book. He is the one who most probably put the cap on the views of the new man that really the NSC was simply an Eisenhower idiosyncrasy carried over for the Truman years and that he might as well abandon it. As Dulles' own executive director, Kirkpatrick, was ably pointed out the, this abandonment of the NSC by Kennedy led directly to the Bay of Pigs and its great failure and most likely to other things that followed, including the Vietnam initiatives, digress, Specifically speaking to that every decision we make currently in this organization of Democrat versus Republican is crucial to the history of which direction our country will head to, which is freedom with the Republicans or your own personal jail cell with the Democrats. It is not hollow wordplay to read into the Dulles book these deeper, most sinister meanings. Anyone who has had a privilege of having read both publications, the 1948 report and this book will be able to confirm the subtle and premedicated structuring of Dulles's powerful course of action. Dulles was able, was an able discipline of the Goebbels School of Propaganda. Mr. Dulles's enlightening paraphrase of the fifth duty from the National Security Act is as close to as close as he gets to the bit of the law through the whole course of the book until six pages from the end. Then he clearly runs the fourth duty and the fifth duty together in which a way that the reader will most likely not even recognize them for what they are. A fabulous tactic that Obama utilizes. And Dulles will have purged his conscience 
by being able to say that he covered all the law verbatim. That he did, but it was a, mean, a masterful job of obfuscation and of mind bending, all of which is happening on the internet. If ever a technique of brainwashing has been put to good use, it has been done by Alan Dulles and others of the ilk. Having used his much mind bending at the start of his book, he then follows his 40 pages of interesting anecdotes and history, after which he comes right back to the same brainwashing saying, a Republican Congress agreed with General Donovan, which in fact it did not. And with complete bipartisan approval, the CIA was established in the National Security Act of 1947. It was an openly acknowledged arm of the executive branch of the government, although of course, it had many duties of a secret nature. Here again, he used the techniques of the ST by associating the public language of the law quite incorrectly with the idea that it had many duties of a secret nature. As we know from our view of the law above, it did not have duties of a secret nature. At least it did not have them in the law. He went on to say that President Truman saw, it, saw to it that the new agency was equipped to support our government's effort to meet communist tactics. This is a variance with Truman's own words about this quiet intelligence arm of the president. What Truman himself sa said was, I never had any thought when I was set up the CIA that it would be injected into a peacetime cloak and dagger operations. Truman, the man who signed the bill into law, says that it was never his intention that the CIA would have such duties Again, Alan Dulles brushes such things aside to make a case for the agency. He did so much to change from the quiet intelligence arm into the most powerful peacetime operational force ever created. Dulles continued with a ritualistic chant by adding, its broad scheme was in, in a sense unique in that it combined under one leadership the overt task of intelligence, analysis, and coordination with the work of secret intelligence operations of the various types I shall describe. He employs the techniques of beginning with the th a thought that is correct, intelligence analysis and coordination, and then when the reader is trapped, he continues into an area he wants the reader to think is equally correct. The work of the secret intelligence operations, characteristically, he has not bothered to define secret intelligence operations even inside the government, where such terms are used with some frequency, there is much controversy about the real meaning of that phrase, secret intelligence operations. As a further clue to where Mr. Dulles is planning to take the reader, notice his use of the word operations and then recall his blunt through meaningless early statement, the CIA is not an underground operation. He is already back at that time and beginning to work it around so that the reader will believe that the CIA and operations are wedded. Only a few times farther on, he says, CIA was given the mandate to develop its own secret collection arm, which was to be quite distinct from the part of the organization that had been set up to assemble and evaluate intelligence from other parts of the government. He continues his clever intertwining of fact with fact to create a pattern that then woven further with his contrived designs is totally the variance with the original. Going back to discussing the internet and the abilities to post story to Instagram and utilizing their strategy to create gossip columns within their organizations known as Instagram accounts. To paint a picture, as I stated before, to show you nothing but lies which is a detriment to society considering 14 point million people are struggling with the idea of what happened today. Selfishness, psychosis, and the Democratic Party. The only mandate he had mentioned to this book in this, the point in this book was the law of 1947. The mandate to which he is making reference in this context, however, was contained In a National Security Council Intelligence Directive, NSCID 10-2 of August 1948, 
The directive did authorize the CIA to develop a secret division to perform certain secret activities, but it was a far cry from what Dulles is describing. The law did not authorize secret or clandestine activities. However, agency protagonists contained to put pressure on the executive branch to permit the CIA to collect secret intelligence. The argument most frequently given was that since the United States had always been lily white in the area of foreign policy, there was no organization that could fight the communists in their own dirty way. It was proposed that since the CIA, which had resembled, reassembled some of the former OSS operators possessed a demonstrated know-how to carry out secret intelligence operations, it should be permitted to form a unit for that purpose. In the beginning, this idea was avowed avowedly limited to secret intelligence. The CIA disclaimed any intention of using secret intelligence as a bridge to secret operations. Finally, the NSC consented and published its Directive 10-2. However, anyone who had the opportunity to have read the directive would have been amazed to find what links the NSC want to in order to restrain the CIA from going too far in the direction Absolutely contrary to Mr. Dulles' contention that the CIA was given many duties of a secret nature and then equipped to perform these duties, the NSC directive did authorize the CIA to set up an Office of Policy Coordination, which would be prepared to engage in secret intelligence activities. However, the director of that office had to be selected by the Secretary of State and approved by the Secretary of Defense. The personnel of the office was to be CIA employees, but their boss was hired and fired by the secretaries of state and defense. This was done to keep the DCI from having control over him and thus over the clandestine activity of the office. This was partial victory for the clandestine operations activities, but it was an unhappy solution. At that time, the, sec the secretary of defense was Lewis Johnson. He had embarked upon a rigid budget-cutting program by the direction of Truman. Another part of this NSC directive prohibited the CIA from having the funds to carry out clandestine activities. It stated that if and when the NSC directed such actions, it would, as a function of its directive, state how the activity would be manned, equipped, and paid for. In the beginning, Congress had not found it necessary to put any special constraints, excuse me, re restraints upon the CIA for budgeted and approved funds since Congress intended that the CIA would be an overt coordinator of intelligence. It made no plans to hide the CIA money in various secret accounts. However, the NSC provided that the CIA was not to use intelligence funds for clandestine activities, but it was not allocated funds from other sources whenever such operations were directed. In this manner, the custom of having CIA funds buried and hidden in the allocations of other departments and agencies began. The intent at first was for this to be a control device for the agency's activities and not a full blood tide of money pouring into the without a check or constraint into a horn of plenty to support CIA clandestine operations. Again, there were and are few who had the opportunity to see these working papers, but in 1949, a most excellent bit of staff work produced a long letter to the DCI under the signature of Secretary. Secretary of Defense Johnson. It contained a full outline of how much how such funding would operate, how it would be moved unseen from one department and agency to another in accordance with the provisions of a little notice law stop. The National Economy Act of 32 was amended in the Legislative Branch Appropriation Act of 1933 of June on of June 30th, 1932. It was also stipulated how the gaining agency would be required to reimburse the losing agency for all expenses and especially for those that were clearly out of pocket. This con control was much more effective in those days because the CIA had very little money it could put into costly clandestine operations. As a result, the CIA was very restricted in what it could do as long as the Secretary of Defense required that the DOD be reimbursed. In later years, the stipulation was reversed and there occasionally were hints from the CIA that it would seek compensation from the DOD for the intelligence it provided. Another factor of importance was that at that time, there were a number of qualified, competent, and top echelon men who were familiar with the provisions of the National Security Act of 1947, which was the NSCIDs, 
And when the implementing directives arrived from all of them, they knew very well that all of this was being done to keep the CIA under control and to prohibit it from going ahead with the clandestine operation or secret intelligence without clear and specific authority. But no one would ever know this from reading Alan Dulles's book. In a later chapter, more will be said about the financial arrangements to include the Central Intelligence Agency Act of 1949. Just a few lines after this statement about the CIA's mandate, Mr. Dulles makes another point designed to have the reader believe that clandestine operations were a very matter of fact thing. One of the unique features of the CIA was that its evaluation and coordinating side was to treat the intelligence produced by its clandestine arm in the same fashion that information from other government agencies was treated. That sentence really does not mean to a thing pertinent to what he had been saying in his book. With the one big exception, he is including the clandestine arm idea with an otherwise true and correct statement. It's evaluating and coordinating side to make the reader believe that because one statement has the ring of truth, the other must be true also. Then he continues with one of the boldest and most brazen statements. There would be no reason to call it bold and brazen except for the fact that he is making all of these remarks in the part of the book he calls the evolution of American intelligence. The use of the word evolution, I wonder who else uses that word, Con con connotes a theme of chrono chronological development by sequence. He has been manipulating the chron chronology to make what he is saying appear to be a part of the law or of other true directives when in fact they did not develop it in quite that order. Thus the next statement is most significant. Another feature of the CIA structure which did not come about all at once but was a result of gradual merges which experience showed to be practical and efficient with the incorporation of all clandestine activities under one roof, roof and one management. The statement is not untrue as it stands, but it is not true not because of the law or of directives which created the CIA as it is today. The final rollover of the evolutionary process was a runaway situation created more of the ST itself, in which even the agency was one of the tools in the greater action than it was by law and design of the normal channels of the government. This whole issue has been made needlessly complex by those who have been willing, have been unwilling to submit to and comply with the law and the NSC directives as they have been written. We have said earlier that one of the most important factors